Well, I remember just about at every conference we'd get together and he said, Jamal, there's only like three people who are interested in what we do. I said, yes, three of us go to a bar and duke it out there and not bore anyone else. Um, but I was very pleased to see uh, that the replica of the Magamical ship was launched before it passed away and I was hoping to be able to be on it with him, but that was not to be. So, in memoriam of Dear Yawk. So the first presentation of the day today is the Akko Tower Wreck. And um, it's by Deborah Chvika. Let's try to keep to our times, please, so that we can be on the coffee break on time. And there is another session afterwards. You know how to use it. Thank you, Jamal. Yes, it is. Good afternoon. My name is Deborah Zwickel, and it gives me great pleasure to present the Akko Tower shipwreck. Akko is located at the northern extremity of Haifa Bay in northern Israel and has over 4,000 years of history from the early Bronze Age to the modern era, serving as an imported naval and trading port. The prevailing wind inside the harbor is from the northwest. It varies with local conditions and is influenced by the town. The harbor is open to the southwest, the direction of the winter storms and the moderate summer breeze and high seas, but is sheltered by the town from northerly winds. In addition, there are hazards to navigation, shoals to the south and southwest, rocks to the west, and shallow water. Considering these facts, Local knowledge is essential when entering the harbor, especially considering the draft of the vessel. In 1831, when the town was taken by an Egyptian naval and land force, the small port was partially silted up and the anchorage was accessible only for small vessels. Over a period of about 60 years from Sidney Smith's defense during Napoleon Bonaparte's siege in 1799, to the survey of the Bay of Akko and the town by Menzel in, a, in HMS Firefly in 1860, Akko and her harbor were the scene of several naval operations. During this time, ships, both merchant and naval, from various fleets, European, American, and Eastern Mediterranean, frequented Akko Harbor. It was suggested that the Akko Tower wreck is the remains of one of these ships. The shipwreck was discovered during an underwater survey of the ancient harbor of Akko conducted in 1966 by an Israeli-British expedition headed by Elisha Linder and Alexander Flinder. The shipwreck was surveyed tw twice since its discovery, by Avner Aban in 1975 and by J. Richard Steffi in 1981. While Flinder and Raban suggested that the shipwreck was the remains of a 45-meter-long warship, that was scuttled by the British during the French, the French siege of Akko in 1799, Steffi suggested that she was a 25-meter-long European merchantman dated to the 19th century. The conflicting conclusions of the various scholars demanded an explanation, and following the wish that the shipwreck be studied further, a long-term full-scale project has begun. The Akko Tower wreck site is at the entrance to Akko Harbor, 20, uh, 35 meters north of the Tower of Flies, after which it was named, and at a depth of 4.4 meters. The shipwreck was excavated for four seasons in 2012, 2014, 2015, and 2016 by the Leon Rekanati Institute for Maritime Studies at the University of Haifa, in cooperation with the Israeli Nautical Officers School at Akko, which also used as the expedition's base. The shipwreck remains lying northwest to south, lying northeast, sorry, to southwest, are 17.8 meters long and 6.4 meters wide, and were covered with stones. Some of the timbers were in a poor state of preservation, apparently due to the lack of protection afforded by the thin sand layer covering the shipwreck, the stone pile, and previous examinations of the site. Only the very lowest section of the hull survived, 
comprising a keel and a rising wood, a keelson and sister keelsons, frames, hull planks, ceiling planks, limber boards, and longitudinal reinforcing components. The following slides summarize what we have found of the surviving timbers. The keel was made of Aleppo or Calabrian pine and has a half log cross section. It was maximum 22 centimeters wide and 10.5 centimeters thick. At the southwestern end of the shipwreck, the keel was 19 centimeters wide and 6.5 centimeters thick. This, in addition to two 16 millimeter diameter brass nails, implied the existence of a scarf with an end post. The keel was chamfered at an angle of 68 degrees to the horizontal line of the base. A 13.5 meter long rising wood made of black pine was fixed onto the keel. It was typically, typically 24 centimeters wide and varied between 7.5 and 8.4 centimeters thick. The timber had recesses for accommodating the framing timbers from above and where the recesses were cut, the width of the rising wood was reduced to 18 centimeters. 69 framing timbers made of oak have been found comprising 24 frame stations. There is evidence of three additional frame stations in the exposed section of the rising wood at the northeast, the timber of which did not survive. The timbers were 13 centimeters sided and 14 centimeters molded with an average room and space of 37 centimeters. The framing consisted of double sewn frames, each comprising two full frames one consisting of a floor timber and second fadox, and the other two half frames and third fadox. The midship frame was located about nine meters aft of the southwestern end of the shipwreck. The timbers were connected to one another by a combination of iron spikes and tree nails. Thirteen, thirteen strakes survive on each side of the keel, all made of various pine species. The hull planks averaged 22 centimeters wide and 6 centimeters thick. The hull planks were fastened to the framing timbers by a combination of brass spikes and tree nails. The 10 centimeters long brass spikes were chiseled shaped rather than pointed and were driven in with the wide side of the end perpendicular to the wood grain of the plank. The hull planks were butt jointed over frames, some were aligned with each other on the same frame station. The existence of repairs suggests that the ship was in use for a long period. 26 oak and pine planks, but jointed to create ceiling strakes, were fastened to the framing timbers by tree nails and iron nails. These ceiling planks average 19 centimeters wide and 5 centimeters thick. The surviving part of the keelson was about six meters long, broken at both ends. The keelson was composed of two pine timbers connected by a flat scarf and two iron nails. The keelson was 26 to 28 centimeters sided and 18 to 19 centimeters molded. The limber boards were laid on both sides of the keelson, supported by the sister keelsons at one end and the limber strakes at the other, but not nailed to them. Slots were cut into four of the boards, two on each side of the keelson, probably so that they could be lifted to clean the build. The limber strakes and thick stuff were made of oak. On the upper face of these timbers were small diamond-shaped recesses with the remains of an iron nail at the center of each recess. Various rigging elements were found in the wreck site, comprising blocks and three iron-bound dead eyes. The presence of the iron strap and the chain indicate that the dead eyes functioned as the lower dead eye of a pair and were probably used in the rigging of one of the topmasts. Inside the shipwreck, dozens of fragments of decorated glaze, glazed floor tiles were discovered. The tiles were originally about 20 centimeters square. All were white glazed on the face and decorated with blue and yellow or orange tensile arabesque flowers, tripods and stars. A single broken tile had a part of a stamp of the letter P on its back. Perhaps the name of the manufacturer 
who has not yet been identified. Typological evaluation and the use of commercial cobalt blue and antimony yellow pigments show that the tiles were most probably manufactured in Sicily after 1802 and probably before 1850. The ship's remains were covered by a pile of stones 6.5 meters wide, 10.5 meter long, and up to one meter thick. The stones, not of local Eastern Mediterranean origin, are dark slate with white calcite veins. However, as ballast was loaded and unloaded, mainly in merchantmen, the analysis of the stone may not necessarily indicate the ship's home port or her ports of coal. Additional information about the stones and bricks from the shipwreck can be found in a poster presented here by Amir Bar. Dating. C14 results for the wood samples spread over a period of about 320 years, given a date of 1640 to 1960. dates are not secure and are currently be, being verified with C14 wiggle matching. <laughs> the various finds are dated to the end of the 18th to mid 19th century. A cosmetological investigation of the brass spikes suggested they were most probably manufactured in the first half of the 19th century. The iron fittings of the dead eyes were made of an ill root iron, and based on the microstructure and chemical analysis composition, it is suggested that they were manufactured in the second quarter of the 19th century. Based on these results, the construction of the ship has been dated to the first half of the 19th century, and she operated well into the second half of the century. To summarize, the Akotara wreck is the remains of a brig about 25 meters long, built in the first half of the 19th century. Her draft was about three meters, which would have made entering Akko Harbor difficult since the entrance is narrow with navigational hazards and water less than three meters deep, 100 meters inside the harbor entrance. Some construction features, such as the framing pattern and the frame and hull plank fastening, suggest that she was built under the influence of the French shipbuilding tradition in an established shipyard. She was apparently a merchant vessel, not a warship, one of many which called it Akko Harbor. This is consistent with Steffi's hypothesis that the shipwreck is the remains of a Western European merchantman exceeding 25 meters in length and dated to the 19th century. Nevertheless, the circumstances of the wrecking are yet to be determined. I would like to dedicate this presentation to the memory of Professor Yaakov Kahanov, my teacher, my colleague, and my friend. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Comments? Well, I'll start out. You probably said it and I missed it. What was the composition of the nails? Was it Munce metal or is it bronze? Brass. Brass, not, not, not Munce metal. Brass. brass. Pure brass. Yes. So I can't remember now. Munce metal was patented, what, 1839? 1836. 32 or 30? Hmm? 6? 1836. So this would predate it, perhaps? You know, you say you gave it the first half of the 19th century. Since there's no months metal on it, it might be earlier. Then the yes, yes, you can I think it's fine tune a little first, bit more the date. First third of the 19th yeah. century, yes, for the brass nail. Does so anyone have any questions? The other thing was, why was it so unusually preserved? Was there dredging in the harbor that destroyed the ends? What was the uh, one of the reasons we think, uh, well, first the ballast pile. Then in Akko you have a very thin layer of sand, so it doesn't preserve well the shipwrecks. And also previous investigations, because uh, they covered the ship, recovered it with stones. So when you remove mm. the stones and then put them back on the, uh, on the wood, on the timbers, it destroyed them. And also because of the... Um, 
marine activity in Akko Harbor, you have the, it's a fisherman harbor, so you have uh, ships coming in and out. And so if there are no questions, we can move on to our next presentation. We still have three minutes if you have any questions. So our second presentation of the day is a preliminary study of the remains of four vessels found in the ancient harbor of Naples, Italy. Uh, the, uh, pro the authors are Giulia Boetta, Chiara Zazzaro, and um, Pierre Povedo, and uh, Chiara Zazzaro will be giving us the presentation. Chiara, please. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizer of this wonderful conference, also on behalf of the co-author. The urban, the urban archaeology operation undertaken from 1999 to 2016 in Naples for the Metro Lines 1 and 6 was a rare and a unique opportunity to investigate the coastal landscape of the ancient city. In addition to the port infrastructures, the excavation provided the evidence of seven vessels dating between the Hellenistic and the Imperial era. This long-term operation was conducted under the scientific direction of Daniela Giampaola of the Archaeological Superintendents of, uh, of Campania and involved a large number of specialists belonging to different public and private institutions. This paper will present the operation conducted on the four vessels discovered in 2013-2015, Napoli E, F, G, and H, a preliminary study of their characteristics and hypothesis concerning the original function. The metro lines one and six extend along the coastal area between the ancient city of Neapolis and the new town found at the new town found at, found at the sixth and, um, and beginning of the fifth century BC, and Parthenope, the previous settlement found by Greeks at the beginning of the seventh century BC on the actual um, hill fort of Pizzo Falcone. Um, so let's see now the um, context. The geological survey and the archaeological excavation in Piazza Bovia and Piazza Municipio revealed that in antiquity the coast formed here a large bay bordered by the geographical feature of Santa Maria in Porto Salvo to the east and the hill of Castelnuovo to the west. In Piazza Municipio, the excavation provided the evidence of an interrupted stratigraphic data set and structures going from the 3rd century BC to the actual uh, period. The implementation of an artificial harbor started in the 3rd century BC with the huge dredging, dredging works attested by the discovery of large intersecting pits. On the bottom of these pits, the traces left by the buckets used for the excavation were visible. The dredges removed the marine sediment until the Neapolitan yellow tough bench. This intervention aimed to create a proper harbor basin within enough draft for ships and to maintain efficient the harbor, avoiding the silting. Important building works accompany this dredging in Hellenistic time. A ramp, perhaps for the beaching, and terracing walls. I don't know if it's... The ramp will be here and the terraces wall here. In Roman time, the uh, new infrastructure, uh, infrastructures were built, two wharfs, thermal buildings, quays, and a road. This sector of the port maintains its fun functionality up to the beginning of the 5th century AD, when the harbor basin was transformed in marshland and completely filled with the sediments. So let's go now to the... Um, to give a look to the shipwrecks found in 2004, already presented um, elsewhere by Giulia Boet in the past. Uh, these were three vessels dating to the imperial period. Two of them were abandoned at the end of the first century AD, Napoli A and C, and the third one, Napoli B, uh, with this cargo of limestones, wrecked at the end of the second century, beginning of the third century AD, near a wharf. Napoli A and B um, are sailing vessels, while Napoli C belongs to another functional type due to its transom bow, which allows the ships to move uh, perpendicular to the quay, 
and to his hull shape, this ship was used for harbor service within the Bay of Naples. So this one. Between 2013 and 2015, the investigation of the area which connects the station of Line 1 and 6 to the ferry harbor revealed the remains of four new vessels and some findings related to navigation. Our communication, so this one, our communication will be organized as follows. First, we will briefly present the remains of the Hellenistic vessels Napoli E and H of the 2nd century BC. Then we will present the remains of the vessel dated to the 2nd um, and the beginning of the 3rd century AD, Napoli F and G. And finally, we will present some of the findings related to the navigation. Mm, Napoli E is poorly preserved. This extremity is composed by a fragment of keel, some flash lead strakes connected with the closely sets of mortise and tenon joints, a floor timber, and fragments of a few other frames. Lead sheet protects the, the outer shell, while a thick layer of pitch ensures the internal protection. Um, as Napoli E, Napoli H was cut by the excavation trench, so only one extremity is preserved. The flash lead planking consists of four or five strakes located to the east and west of the central axis. The keel is not preserved. The two sides of the hull, uh, the hull are spaced of about one meter. The planking bears some traces of um, reparation. Only one floor timber was uh, conserved in situ. It has a rectangular cross section and presents a single rectangular shape at the limber hole on its western branch. And, uh, here. Copper nails inserted in three nails assure the assembly with the planking. The marks left by other five frames are visible in the planking. The position of these frames is also marked by the row of assemblages. Uh, the room and space between the assemblages is 39 uh, centimeters on average. The VEC Napoli F was discovered at a depth of uh, 1.7 below the ancient sea level. The excavation trench cuts diagonally the VEC. The western side um, on which the, uh, the hull led is preserved up to the second whale, while the eastern side is poorly preserved. So basically this one is most preserved site. Um, the axial carpentry consists in a segment of the, the transitional timber and the fragment of a steam turn post and steam post, or steam post. We don't know because um, the direction of this, the vessel is not, uh, is not known. The keyhood um, hook scarf connecting these two pieces is locked with an horizontal wedge and by an iron bolt or large nail. It is likely that this vertical joint will bring together floor timber to the axial uh, carpentry. The transitional timber is car carved by triangular rabbits for the insertion of the strakes that are then uh, locked with the nails and mortise and tenon joints. The planking is flush lead and is assembled by closed set mortise and tenon joints. The western, part, the western side is composed by 20 strakes, two of which are whales. The planking is 2.2 cm thick and the uh, whale 7 cm thick. Repairs are numerous and consist of planks uh, simply nailed to the frame, planks with the mortise and tenon joints only on the lower edge, and planks with the repair tenons inserted from the inside of the hull. Three rectangular uh, lead patches have been also observed on the outer uh, side of the planking. The transversal carpentry consists of 15 frames. They are spaced between 18 and 26 centimeters. Floor timbers and half frames seem to be systematically alternated. Three four timbers have a triangular shape and one is connected to the keel with a, an iron bolt. The floor timbers are extended on the western side by photox. Limber holes are also mm, visible on one floor timber. The frames are connected to the planking by three nails. Among the seven frame repairs, three of them are connected to the planking only by means of nails and correspond to internal reinforcement to fix the numerous pointed end of the plank uh, repairs. The large amount of three nails observed on the other um, four uh, frame repairs are clear indication of the important reparation activity on this boat. The stringers, best preserved on the western side, are assembled to the frame by iron nails. Four small movable planks are situated between these stringers. On the top of the two stringers, 
settled near the keel, two small planks are nailed, uh, and this feature allows to accommodate transverse uh, movable planks. Napoli G was found at a depth of uh, 1.54 meter below the ancient sea level. Although uh, the southwest uh, end has been cut off by the excavation trench, the boat is well preserved. The transom extremity located at the east is exceptionally preserved. The longitudinal hull profile is asymmetrical, while the am amidship is a section is quite rounded. Uh, the keel is very small, 6.6 uh, to 8 centimeter in width, and it becomes thinner towards the transom, passing from 7 to 3 centimeter. Toward the transom, the keel is only 4 centimeter wide, probably due to the presence of knots and ramifications. This problem was corrected by widening the garboards. The transom was originally formed by at least two superimposed elements connected with mortise and tenon joints. Only the bottom element is preserved. This is settled on the keel vertically, but it was not connected to it. During the disassembly of the hull, we were able to see a wedge found in between the keel and the transom. The transom was then connected to the planking by means of iron nails and three nails driven from the outside. Uh, the transom, such as the planking, is completely covered by thick layer of pitch. The flush lead planking consists of six strakes on both sides with some oblique joints. Um, it's then assembled by closely sets of uh, mortise and tenon joints. The peg fixing tenons are spaced, um, spaced in average 16 centimeters. The conserved frames are 29. Uh, there are two marks on two frames um, towards west. Um, and the alternation between four timbers and half frames is not always um, respected. The room and space between the frames is uh, 17 centimeters. The limber holes are rectangular and are positioned along the keel axis, and they are present on uh, all the frames. The connection between the frames and the planking is ensured by three nails and nails. A bolt or big uh, iron nails fixed uh, um, at least four floor timbers and one half uh, frame on which passed the keel. The internal longitudinal carpentry consists of uh, two stringers and, two, and four movable planks. The two stringers present two carvings forming a subcircular sub space 20 centimeter wide um, this is a feature uh, that in the sailing vessels um, was um, a conformation uh, to connect, uh, with, which can be connected by, with the presence of a bilge, a bilge pump. Um, in this case, uh, due to the small dimensions of the vessel, we suggest that this feature could uh, have been used to bail out manually the water from the bilge. The characteristic of the remains of the four vessels show that they were based on a shell structural concept and on a longitudinal strake oriented hull shape. The bidding process was shell first. Considering the poor level of conservation of the oldest wrecks, Napoli E and H, their architectural and functional type and their original form are unknown. Napoli F shows characteristics similar to those of the Western Mediterranean Roman imperial architectural type defined by Patrice Pomet. From a functional point of view, this is a sailing vessel. Napoli G, on the other hand, shows previously unknown features due to the presence of the transom extremity, which recalls other asymmetrical boats found in Napoli, Napoli C, uh, Toulon, Toulon A and D, and Ostia Isola Sacra 1. Uh, where the transom corresponds to the bow in, this, uh, four, in these four cases. These vessels belong to the family of the Orea type of craft uh, known by the written and iconogra iconographic sources. De depending from their dimensions and propulsion, these vessels were used um, as harbor lighters or for fishing. However, Napoli G is distinguished for the shape of the transom, which is triangular, the absence of internal support for the transom, and the presence of a bilge recess uh, near the transom extremity. As the recovery of the bilge water is normally located in the lower part of the ship near the stern, it is possible that the transom will therefore correspond in Napoli G to the stern and not to the bow, as in the other transom vessels. 
the reconstruction of the original shape will possibly provide additional data for the functional interpretation of this craft. To conclude, during the excavation, a large number of fragments of ores and masts used as mooring poles were rediscovered. Their chronology spans from the 1st to the 4th century AD. The most important discovery concerned the ores with uh, the counterweights and some blades. And most of all, uh, two parts of mast belonging to small boats. One fragment can be identified with the top of a mast. This piece has two remarkable features, an open recess with a semicircular piece of hardwood dedicated to the traveling of the halyard. Um, and up in the recess, the top of the mast was reduced to, to fit both shirts and uh, four stay. The second fragment corresponds to the lower part of another small mast with a semicircular tenon <coughs> for the rising and lowering of the rigging on the, uh, on the mast step. Two passing holes also probably some fixing devices. Thank you. Fascinating. I'm sure there are some questions. Well, let me start out. Uh, I have a question on the hard but let's do the ships first. Uh, you don't have one of those? Okay. Well, you're, you're loud enough. Okay. <laughs> I'm just wondering if there are any uh, repairs, signs for repairs. Oh, on which one? Uh, yes, on F, uh, Napoli F, uh, we have uh, three different types of repairs. Um, sorry? Yeah, three different, uh, we, we both have uh, lead sheets outside in three parts, and then uh, we have uh, tenons inserted uh, from the um, inside, only on the lower part of uh, the plank. Uh, we have repair tenons and... Uh, what is the other one? Ah, it just planks uh, nailed uh, to the planking. Napoli F. Napoli G has uh, some uh, um, one or two lead sheets uh, from the outside. Someone else have their hand up there? Dave? Just, I was waiting for the, sh the, the ship experts first. What's interesting is that they built moles which <laughs> preserved the, sh the ships, which is great. The moles seem to have been responsible for the silting up of the harbors, uh, which is an interesting aspect. But you, if I'm right, you have a mold close to Rex ABC and then another breakwater which was built further out which was responsible for silting up the harbours which is quite a thought uh, and I know Christophe Morhan we're not talking about the ramp which is Christophe said uh, oh, it's Blackman's problem but um, I did, it's, it's a wonderful site but I'm wondering you know uh, is it thanks to harbour construction and silting up of harbours that we have such wonderful preservation of the shipwrecks? It's quite a thought. Maybe I can answer. Okay. So, uh, yes, you have to... There was this huge um, activity of dredging to settle the harbour, and this was continuing till from the 1st uh, BC till the 2nd BC. And also, so they, they built, they, they did the dredging, and then they continued to dredge in order to uh, maintain the, the navigation inside the, the basin. But, but after, uh, it happens that um, this dredging activity stopped. And so uh, the, the harbor start to catch all the, um, the sediments and start to be filled. And at that moment, the, the A and C uh, shipwreck were, ship were abandoned within the harbor, and suddenly they were uh, completely um, filled up with. The, and so, for this, we have this good 
uh, preservation of the of the of the ships. This is the way. And then the other uh, on the later time uh, B or or the the new ones that we are at the end of the second uh, beginning of the third. And uh, in that uh, we are not really thinking about abandon, but maybe uh, sometime uh, wreckage or, or something like this in part of the harbor that we are not so uh, useful for navigation. But of course, as you can see, the, the excavated part are, are limited, and the harbor basin was enormous. And of course, so you have to imagine that uh, this, this operation is very costly and is in urban archaeology. So we have uh, at least 20 meters in depth that was excavated from the modern time till the ancient time. So it's, uh, it's uh, not possible to, to do all the extension of the excavation in all this area. But it was uh, very lucky. Okay. Which means the harbour engineers were not that clever, but thank, they could not prevent the silting of the harbour, but at least as a result we have the wonderful shipwrecks preserved. It's like Marseille, but it's, for me as a harbour specialist, it's interesting from the side to see that there were limits on their capacity of in dealing with the silting problem. Yeah. yeah. But we have your beautiful shipwrecks. Uh, I was just wondering what the future of these ships is, if they've been conserved and if they're going on display. Okay, so the first uh, three shipwrecks were um, dis partly dismantled, and then the two big biggest were uh, retrieved entire. And they are now in, in water, so kept in water and waiting for conservation process, of course. It's a very uh, expensive operation. The, 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 other, uh, the other two, uh, Napoli F and C, were dismantled and again uh, they are in water. We have a big problem in Italy with, Italy with the, um, about the conservation uh, in general for, for, for waterlogged wood, of course, only for this, and because of a lack of huge infrastructure to do this. And you, you can imagine a large amount of wood that you, can, you have to, try to treat here. So it's, um, uh, is a, a problem also of, um, of, uh, of the continuation of excavation. We have to imagine that they started this operation for the metro in 1999 and it's just finished last year. And so the, the local um, superintendent has to, to, to decide uh, to work with uh, a lot of specialists of all the time uh, in continue, uh, very uh, continue through, you know. So it's, uh, it was not possible also to, to start with the new project uh, for the conservation because of this uh, continuous uh, uh, problematic of, uh, of excavation. And uh, before to reach the harbor, you have the medieval, uh, post-medieval, medieval, and late antique, etc. Stra strata with a lot of structure. So this, they, I'm not presenting the harbor now, but there was a, a other problems of conservation and restoration and dismantling and taking away other structures. So it's a complex. Uh, but in the next year, now we have to 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 reach these uh, problems of conservation. So it will be for the next time. And to find, voilà. so. Before one, I just one quick question. Uh, there was the ship, various ship components, such as uh, oars. You said were just poles. Yeah. Were, were you saying that there were just poles driven in to tie the ships? Yes. To? Yeah. 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 We had similar situation excavated in Yenico, but mm -hmm. we had a different interpretation for some of the oars, mm -hmm. where we find oar blades. Mm -hmm. And this usually occurs at the very shallow parts of the harbor yeah. that's being silted in, where you often find derelicts. And we assumed that they were basically small boats getting caught there mm -hmm. because the oars were small, yeah. and they were using them as punts to free the boat from the seabed, and occasionally they break. Yeah. And that's why you find the blades rather than the rest yeah. of it. Yeah. Yes, maybe. Yeah. Okay, uh, perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we're moving on to our third presentation of the day. Well, what do you know? We have Deborah to speak out again. The construction of the Magan Mikhail uh, II shipwreck, Avner Hillman, 
and Deborah Sika. So yes, here I am again. Good afternoon. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to present the story of the construction of the replica of the Magan Michael ship. The Magan Michael shipwreck was discovered in 1985, 70 meters from the shoreline of Kibbutz Magan Michael, 30 kilometers south of Haifa, Israel. The shipwreck was at a depth of 1.5 meters and buried under 1.5 meters of sand. Three seasons of underwater excavations were carried out at the site during 1988 and 1989 under the direction of the late Elisha Linder. The hull remains were 11.15 meters long, 3.11 meters wide, and 1.5 meters deep, comprising the entire keel, the false keel, the stem, the stern post, remains of planks on the starboard side up to strike 12, and on the port side up to strike 7, two knees, one at the bow and the other at the stern, parts of 14 frames, some of the fatacks and top timbers, a central stringer, the mast and several internal timbers. The hull had a wine glass shaped cross section. It was dismantled underwater and the timber sections were retrieved and conserved at the laboratory of the Leon Recanati Institute for Maritime Studies at the University of Haifa. The archaeological timbers were reassembled and are now exhibited in the Hecht Museum at the University of Haifa. The ship has been dated to about 400 BC and the hull was built shell first with some sewing in an East Greek Phocaean shipbuilding tradition using timber from the western coast of Asia Minor. An attempt was made to reconstruct the hull lines of the original ship which raised the problem of how to reconstruct the missing upper parts of the end posts and the frames, the upper strakes and the continuation to the end posts. The basis for the reconstruction was the archaeological remains. Where the archaeological evidence ended, iconography, ceramics, graffiti, and clay models of the 6th and 5th centuries BC was used to supplement the missing information. Comparisons were made with nearly contemporary shipwrecks such as, as the Carinia and Jules Verne 7. A complete set of hull lines was generated by the interaction between computer-aided design and model building, and the planking pattern was developed up to the gunnel. The original merchant ship, as reconstructed, was 14.4 meters overall length, with a beam of 4.24 meters over frame, and 2.6 meter depth amidships. She had 18 strakes, including three whales. Fully loaded with a cargo capacity of 16 tons, she displaced 23 tons with a draft of 1.4 meters. Building a sailing replica of the Magan Michael ship was the goal of the project from the moment the significance of the ship was understood. The project became viable at the beginning of 2014 with a generous private donation and the key line ceremony took place in July 2014. The replica was constructed at the Israeli Nautical Officers School at Akko and the team comprised experienced carpenters and other professionals and experts, students of the university, cadets from the Nautical Officers School, Sea Scouts and volunteers who were involved in formal and informal activities connected to the construction of the replica, all working under direction of the late Yaakov Kahanov, head of the project. The research aims were twofold. Research in depth of ancient ship construction by the shell first method using mortise and turn on joints and sewing and testing the ship's sailing capabilities while learning about life on board. The archaeological evidence served as the primary source of information. All the components were recorded down to the smallest detail, such as wood grain, knots, nails, and the like. The same tree species were used as in the original ship, mainly Pinus brutia and some Quercus components. 
Timbers were in installed in the, in the same direction of growth of the tree, with the concave side of the ring facing the inside of the hull as were well the original timbers. An interesting challenge was the coordination between two and three dimensions, the bending and twist of the planking and the positioning of the mortises. Angles of dead rise were taken from the archaeological evidence and from the reassembled hull. Mortises were cut in the keel. Their angles varied from 45, MHip, 45 degrees amichip to almost vertical at the end posts, requiring the varying thickness of the garboard along the hull. The garboards were connected to the keel without rabbits, but fitted into rabbits in the end posts. While making the mortises and their decreasing angle towards the ends, it became clear that it was impossible to make a mortise with an angle of less than 28 degrees to the side of the keel. So the rabbits, had to, so the rabbits at the end were an essential carpentry feature. After a full-scale experiment, the garboards were shaped in a steam box. However, this gave us the feeling that the bending forces were excessive. A procedure for bending all the planks was adopted, soaking in plain water for about three days and then boiling for several hours. The hot plank was taken to the hull and shaped to match the previously installed strake using temporary tenons, levers and clamps. The plank was then left to dry in position for about four days and was then adjusted precisely to within two millimeters to the adjacent plank. When this was achieved, a full set of oak tenons was installed. Every tenon was measured and made for each pair of adjacent mortises. When they all fitted well, the tenons were locked in their mortises by oak pegs. As Professor Kahanov mentioned in his lecture at the 14 ISBSA conference in Gdansk, the analysis of mortise and tenon joints should refer to their, posi to their position in the hull to give fuller information rather than being reported as average or typical dimensions. When two planks are in the same plane, mortise and tenons can be long, for example, near the ends, in the Magan Michael ship up to 11 centimeters. When planks are in, are in an, at an angle to one another, mainly near midships, mortises and tenon must be significantly shorter down to five centimeters. The hull of the Magan Michael ship was sewn at the bow and stern. After the planking was installed, knees were put, knees were put in place and nailed to the keel and end post. The adjacent planks were sewn to the knees and the keel and also to the end post, at least up to the fourth strake. This technique was also used in the replica. One volunteer, a highly skilled retired chief engineer, was introduced to the sewing with only a very basic explanation and was given liberty to research and apply it to the hull. He made a one-to-one -one scale model and then used it in the hull. One of the interesting points in the way he prepared the cutting of the tetrahedral recesses, the marks of the modern sewing are similar to those of the shipwright who stitched the Jules Verne 9 shipwreck for Marseille. The builders of the replica followed shell-first principles and method in an attempt to replicate the archaeological data. However, some major problems and questions arose. Although the technology of the shell-first hull with mortise and tenon joints and sewing survived to some extent, the ancient practical shipbuilding know-how and tradition have been lost. Replicating the archaeological find was more difficult than building a new hull free of archaeological constraints. The carpenters of the replica did not have the freedom that the original Greek shipwright had to make a decision as to their dimensions, shapes, or other aspects of construction. The archaeological information of the planking was complete up to strike three on both sides. From strike four and upwards, the information decreased as the remains became shorter and shorter, which forced the builders to make decisions in extrapolating the missing parts. 
One well-known tradi traditional technique is the use of buttons, but buttons need frames. Practically, it was found that above about six, strike six, matching plank into frames gave the best result in replicating the archaeological data. Therefore, from strike six and seven, floor timbers and fattocks were installed. Thus, up to strike six, seven, the hull was built shell first, and the floor timbers were formed to match the pre-existing hull. From strike six, seven, the dimensions of the planks were dictated by the frames as far as they survived and also by buttons corresponding to missing frames and the reconstructed hull lines. When building the replica, drilling the holes for the wooden pegs left traces on the outer faces of the frames. These traces were not apparent on the frames of the Magan Michael ship, supporting the conclusion that the frames were installed after the shell was completed. This is a proof that the Magan Michael ship was built shell first. The production and driving of the copper nails was more complex than initially <coughs> assumed. The shank had to be hard enough, but its end sufficient, sufficiently flexible to allow clenching. Based on the composition of the original nails and taking into account the fact that they were intensively hammered, a root high conductivity connectivity copper with excellent cold working abilities of a composition similar to that of the original nails was chosen. The nails were made by a coppersmith using traditional methods. The dimensions of the nails, length, head, and cross-section of the shank were as close as possible to the original. The frames were nailed to the planks by drilling the plank and the frame, hammering the nails through the timbers, and double clenching it over the inside surface of the frame in a herringbone fashion in the direction of the keel, similar to the original nails. No caulking remains were evident in the shipwreck. However, the hull timbers were found to be covered, to be coated by a composition of pine resin mixed with asperto wax or bee wax. As asperto wax was not available, bee wax was used in a combination with pine resin at the ratio of one to one, and all, and all the replica's hull components were coated with this mixture. However, under the waterline, charcoal powder was added to this mixture, giving the bottom of the hull its dark color. Where the gap in the seams was found to be more than two millimeters, a traditional caulking material was also used. The ship proved to be watertight. Construction was completed in November 2016. The final dimensions of the replica are 16.6 meters overall length with a beam of 4.3 meters over frames. The ship was rigged with a mask carrying a single square sail based on iconography of vessels of the period. The official launching ceremony took place on March 17, 20, 2017, and the ship was named Magan Michael II. The hydrostatic characteristics of the ships were tested and found to comply with present-day requirements for stability and seaworthiness. The ship received its sailing permit from the Israeli Ministry of Transport. The replica team, headed by the skipper Yochai Palzur, has been conducting sailing experiments since, Dece since December 2016. We hope to share our thoughts and conclusions arising, arising from these voyages with you in the forthcoming 15th ISBSA in Marseille. Thank you for your attention. Do we have any questions? Athena. Hello. Thank you for this interesting talk, Deborah. Um, I know with the shipwreck, there's also been what's been called a carpenter's toolbox found as part of the cargo. Was there any attempt made to look at those tools and try and see if they could be used in the shipbuilding process? Because I saw some modern drill bits in some of your photos, and I just wondered if you had any chance to experiment with tools as well. Uh, yes, our carpenters, they build a, a, a complete set of tools similar to that which was found in the replica, such as bow drills and chisels. 
Uh, we also worked with them in the replica because in some places you could not work with electrical tools, you have to work by hand. And when we also had uh, visitors like school kids and students from the university, then we let them play with the, everybody likes to play with the bow drill and everything. So we had that set in the ship shade of the replica, yes. But they got tired of it very quickly, right? Yes, because you have to work. So. It's the story of all replicas. Yes. Uh, Patrice, Patrice in English. English. Don't ask about the deck. I'm going to ask about the deck. Okay. Just a short question. What sort of tools did you use to cut the recesses of the sewing part? Of the sewing part? Yes. Yeah, the um, chisel. The tetrahedral holes. A chisel Sim and then a, a, a drill to drill the holes. Yes, but a, a simple chisel. Yes. Yeah, he worked with a chisel. Did anyone try using the corner of an ant? No, no, no. Uh, Lucy. Okay, um, I want to ask. You Udi, could you give her the microphone, please? Okay, yeah. So I want to ask, when you were building the replica, if the sewn ends made sense? Do you see what I mean? Yes. I mean, did that... that Uh, yes, it became logical because it helped us with the, uh, uh, in the conversion, convergence of the bow and stern. Then you need the sewing to help you uh, achieve a, a tighter, a closer a closing of the bow and stern. Yes, things started to make sense, at least for me. For who's up? What, what are the long-term plans for the sustainability of, of the project? Well, that is something we are discussing these days. Uh, basically, first thing, uh, I know there was a discussion between Jacques and Patrice Pomey, and as I spoke earlier today with uh, Pierre, uh, we have to win the ISBC regatta, otherwise we'll be in trouble. But... but uh, so hopefully it will be possible uh, to make a joint sailing for the SBSA. But what we are doing now is we move to the other part of the project, which is, which is sailing. So, so far we conducted several sailing experiments along the Israeli coast. And the next stage will be try to sail to Cyprus and then maybe later to Greece, but slowly, slowly. And we're doing it with the replica team, but we also try to give, like today, this morning, there was a visit of school kids in the replica, because it's trying to open this project also to the general public. Sorry, can I just, um, okay, so I want to ask, you said you had to adapt to some of the, some of the archeology span was constraining in the sense of the way that you had, and you had to adapt. I mean, I'm not going to ask you about all of the detail, but I'm, I'm curious to know if you presumably recorded all of that decision-making process as you went through so that everybody else can learn from the experience of well, the whole process, but particularly when the archaeology is somewhat constrained with what you feel is a natural thing to do. Yeah, the, the construction of the replica is a PhD project by Avner Hillman. Uh, it will be written in Hebrew, but he's working on the PhD, I hope, this moment. That's why he's not here. But uh, later on, we hope to make a scientific publication and share with the scientific uh, world our thoughts and uh, so problems. You did all of those everything, everything was recorded. It was part of his PhD. With the <laughs> yes. I have two short questions, if I may. How did you determine the level of the deck, or why did you also prefer 
a full deck with a big hatch instead of a fore and aft deck. Is there anything it's to a, indicate that the deck is at the cap rail, should it, or should it have been lower? It's a fore and aft deck. It's not a complete deck. But well, you got a catwalk on the it's sort of it's connected. It's this catwalk on the side to the level of the deck. It's right. just a plank to enable us yeah. to run back and forth. Otherwise, it would be. But what also then? What about the level? Why is it flush with the cap rail? Could it have been lower, or do you have any evidence for it? Is it just iconography, or okay, for, uh, you know, maritime regulations? Uh, to Not necessarily ma maritime regulations, but mainly to so we can uh, handle the ship. We did a calculation first. The reconstruction was for 18 strikes, so that was the top. And uh, for the bow and stern was what will be the best height of the deck for um, for maneuvering with to, to handle the anchor at the bow, and then at the stern for the stern rudder. But no archaeological evidence for the level, right? No. For the level, no. The second question is like one of the most great, uh, difficult. Can I, can I have a, 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 when, when it was excavated, please, we can't read it. When it was excavated originally, um, there were um, ceramics that seemed to have been placed higher than the others. In other words, what we call the Phoenician or the Persian type, which are short were on top and on the bottom were mainly um, the basket handles, the big basket handle. Mm -hmm. And it seemed from that that they did have a deck and that it's likely, uh, as to the height, this is the people who built the... Uh, right. We're out of time, but I have to ask this because I'm very interested in this. Um, you can come sailing on Friday. Uh, no, we're, we're just going real sailing quick on question Friday. is, is of course, the main problem of building replicas, of course, is to maintain the original size of the evidence that one obtains from the archaeological uh, excavation. And oftentimes, for that reason, frames are pre-erected. In your case, I've, saw, I've seen that you've put the frames on well uh, in advance of the, uh, the finishing of the planking. Was that for the practical consideration of maintaining the... Uh, original dimensions, of or were you having difficulty bending the plank without some uh, uh, effort from the um, the framing? If for maintaining the shape of the hull, because it it, it became have impossible built it without without the frames, if if you needed to. No, no, we could not. We don't know how to do it. Uh, we did it up to the six, seven strike, and then we needed help. Thank you very much. <laughs> We're going to be busy doing the copy then. Uh, moving on, a 12th century Byzantine shipwreck in the port of Rhodes. Presenters, George Kustoflakis and Eric Reith. Who's here? George. Thank you. Hello, please accept the apologies of Eric Reith. He couldn't make it here due to the hindrance of the uh, last moment. Now, Rhodes shipwreck number four was first located heavily silted in 2008 near the entrance of the commercial port of Rhodes, a port installation corresponding to the ancient Megas Limin, referred by Diodorus, and was very shortly presented in 2008 Tropis. Even by that time, it was already noticed that it was an exceptional shipwreck presenting some giant members. What was very roughly documented in 2008 was the northern extremity of the vessel, exposing the upper surviving parts of several frames and also part of something we estimated as a very broad planking, which turned out later to be actually a whale. Although the time consumed on the site was very limited, still some of the finds of the 2008 campaign were indeed impressive. Like the pelt of the goat found squeezed between two frames that turned out to be full of cheese, following a traditional way of making and storing cheese that is still evident today in several places of Greece and Turkey. Several years later, in November 2013, thanks to the funding of, the European, of a European program, it was made possible to go back to the site for one single period and document the relics of that wreck the best way possible. 
Needless to say that when working inside a busy port that still operates during the underwater research, you have to be ready to make many compromises. In 2013, however, the underwater landscape inside the commercial harbor of Rhodes was completely altered, and what was exposed in 2008 was heavily buried under one and a half meters of sediment. We had to remove huge quantities of sand, and it took us several days of digging to come across the remains of the hull of the same wreck, exposing this time the southern extremity of the vessel, while all the removed sand was deposited above the sector we documented in 2008. By that time, I thought uh, that also the southern extremity would serve our case perfectly well, so the excavation was expanded in an area of about 90 square meters, and unearthed extensive parts of the frames, planking, ceiling, kill, kilson, stringers, and part of the bulwark that secluded a compartment in the one end of the vessel. The vessel belonged to a great commercial ship of the second half of the second half of the 12th century, fully loaded with a cargo of Gunchenin III type amphorae. And as we very soon find out, she went down due to an extensive fire which inflicted severely both ship and cargo. The fire caused the total collapse of the cargo, which was found inside the hull, as a condensed stratum of amphora shards. While most of the superstructure was completely destroyed, extended part of the, of the hull under the waterline maintained its initial coherence and was preserved in an excellent state. It is important to note that the architectural study of the wreck was carried in situ without disassembling any architectural remains. In this condition, our observations remained primarily external, and consequently, the architectural study of the wreck has a provisional character. Three areas of the shipwreck were excavated clean and studied in detail. A, the eastern part of the surviving extremity, exposing the keel, Kilson, sister Kilson, ceiling, and a bulwark. B, the eastern part of the middle section, exposing the ceiling and the, of the main hall. And C, the western side of the middle section, exposing mainly frames, foothooks, stringers, and, a plank, and the planking. Numerous traces of burning, partial or, and often superficial, were identified. Obvious traces of burning were not traced in the opposite extremity documented in 2008. All the observations made at the level of the southern extremity of the wreck indicate that the burned remains are located in the lower parts of the wreck, upper face of the floor timbers and inferior sided face of the kilson. By studying the traces of fire, we understand something of the way the ship sank. As it seems, the vessel tilted, lopsided from the one end and went down somehow in the titanic fashion, leaving the southern extremity much longer exposed to flames. The longitudinal section highlights an actual position of the wreck relatively horizontal. In its transverse plan, on the contrary, the wreck presents a slope from the east to west between 15 and 20 degrees. This tilted position of the wreck has two main consequences. In Italy, the architectural remains present present a differential state of conservation according to the part considered. Thus, the western half of the wreck would seem more deeply buried in the sediment and consequently better preserved than the eastern part. In second place, it would seem probable that the wreck is distorted in the transverse plan with a distinct morphological dissymmetry between the two half sections, the eastern one and the western one. Regarding the longitudinal structure, three principal characteristics are to be noted. The basic longitudinal structure is composed of a keel with a rabbit of each side for insertion of the garboard. The southern end of the keel, very badly preserved, would seem to be ended in the form of a scarf intended for the assembly of the, stern, of the stem or the stern post. The keel is reinforced internally by a keelsum whose lower sided face appears notched in the back of the floor timbers. The keel and the keelsum present a curved profile. 
In all logic, the curve, the, the curve of the keel and the keelson must be symmetrical and appears to be prolonged in the form of an important rake which, in the state of preservation of the remains, extends on nearly 5 meters length for a height of 1 meter and 45 centimeters. In addition to the keelson, the longitudinal structure of the hull was reinforced by two sister keelsons laid out parallel to the keelson. Their south extremity finishes outside the transverse, the, uh, transverse bucket. It's here you see the, the beginning and we can follow it also under the cargo in this section here. Three principal characteristics of the frames are to be noted. Firstly, the frames present a general organization based on the side crossing of one element against the other. This arrangement can be observed, for example, on the level of the eastern arm of the floor timber F195, which is crossed with its first futok. In the western half of the rack, it is difficult to precisely locate the level of connection of the framing elements. Secondly, the absence of disassembling the frames did not make possible to observe the mode of crossing of one element against the other, nor its possible join by nailing or pegging. Only one footock on uh, the western side, the footock F101, would seem to be assembled with another framing element observable on the level of the stringer S100. This join would seem to be a hook scarf, which is characteristic of the Mediterranean constructive processes and whose one of the oldest archaeological evidence is that of Colip VI wreck in Catalan, Spain, posterior one century to the wreck of Rhodes. An important aspect to be underlined about the zone of crossing between the two framing elements, uh, indeed this zone constitutes a zone of weakness, which is reinforced by several stringers. The stringers, while firstly contributed to reinforce the assembly of the frames, also take part in the reinforcement of the intern longitudinal structure in complement of the Kilson and the sister Kilsons. They are not just hammered on the internal faces of the frame. Contrarily, they are special made with notches embracing every separate frame. The three rising floor timbers of the southern end of the wreck, located in the covered part of the keel and of which the foot is notched in the back of the keel, are beveled on their lower sided face in contact with the keel and the upper sided face in contact with the keelson. This bevel, in correspondence to the slope of the keel at the keelson, maintains the floor timbers perpendicular to the longitudinal axis of the hull. In the western part of the wreck, 10 cobble strakes were counted. No external evidence of a joint between them was identified during the observation of their inner face. That does not exclude, of course, the existence of possible joints in their edge by means of small tree nails, as in the case of some of the Byzantine wrecks of the former dating excavated in Genicapi. In the southern part of the wreck, however, the four cover planking fragments have no evidence of join with their edge. This absence of join could be interpreted as an architectural fingerprint of the frame first construction. Like the four western cover planks testify, the planks are nailed, probably from the outside, to the frames whose iron concretions mark the position. The sailing plants are composed of two distinct units, a longitudinal sailing applied to the end of the vessel and the transverse sailing occupying the middle ship. The longitudinal sailing uh, studied in the eastern half of the wreck is composed of six planks of variable width which are badly preserved. Only some rare points of nailing are identified. The transverse sailing was primarily, primarily observed in the upper part of the eastern side. It is composed of 11 ceiling planks of which a, a part was dismounted. The planks are laid out in parallel edge against edge and have a regular average width of 25 centimeters. The sailing planks perpendicular to the longitudinal axis of the wreck do not seem to be fixed. 
Their mobility makes it possible to dismount them easily to reach the lower part of the hull, either to clean the rooms and spaces or to empty the water which accumulated there. It is in fact following uh, the disassembly of one part of the floating ceiling that a wooden scoop, remarkably well preserved, was discovered. The sailing planks took support on two parts of the internal longitudinal structure, the Eastern Stinger S210 and the Sister Kilson, and end up to a notch open it in the upper side of the Kilson. The bulkhead is composed of a series of vertical elements made up by a combination of boards and wooden pillars. This transverse bulkhead appears to have a role more functional than structural by separating a narrow southern end of the wreck from the hold intending to receive the cargo. Examples of comparison are the Tatura uh, E uh, shipwreck in Israel dated between the uh, 7th and the 9th century, Yenika P 11 of the 7th century, Yenika P 12, 9th century, beginning of the 10th century, and Yenika P 3, and of course also the Ma uh, Magan Mikael uh, B shipwreck that was presented yesterday. The evidence of the roads, number four ship covers a yet blank period in the Byzantine shipbuilding and spans the chronological gap between the 11th century Cerselli Mani and Yenikapi shipwrecks and the 13th century shipwrecks of the Sea of Marmara. It is quite obvious that the conclusion, our conclusions here can be only very provisional. Taking into consideration the archaeological data collected during the excavation, the architectural principle of the wreck Rhodos IV would seem in all probability, a frame first. And this fits very well also with the date, which we consider it's in the middle of the 12th century or slightly later. One of the characteristics of the Rhodos wreck is its dimensions. Indeed, the excavation Byzantine wrecks, all dating former to that of the wreck in Rhodos, are fishing boats, merchant ships, or warships, not exceeding in general the length of the 20 meters. The wreck Rhodos IV is that of a large merchant ship of which the length was to probably range between 30 and 35 meters. Chronologically, it corresponds to the last golden age of the Byzantine Empire and the revitalization of commerce during the, during the Comenian dynasty, so obviously showcased by the widespread of Gunsenin III type amphorae and the subsequent commercial transportation of luxurious tableware. For all these reasons, the wreck of Rhodos IV appears as a site of major archaeological interest, which would deserve a definition of an ambitious international program of excavation. Before I finish, let me shortly commemorate the team that worked uh, in 2013. We received valuable help from several uh, institutions and representatives, so quickly just say a few names. Julia Boeto, Sabrina Marlier, Vincent Dimas, Philippe Grosco, Irene Raditz, my colleagues from the Department, of course, of Underwater Antiquities, uh, Calliope Baika and Agilus Chobanidis, uh, the Technical University of Athens, and personally, uh, I'm grateful to Natasha Purnu, and, uh, of course, the individual members of the Hellenic Institute of Marine Archaeology, who help greatly with their experience, so Mirto Michali, Xanthiyarhir, Nikos Golfis, Marcos Garas, Fotiniv Lahaki, and Vasilis Medoigins. Thank you very much for your presence. One question. Do you have a supposition how many masts the ship had and what kind of rigging? Was it Latin or square cell or both? Uh, we didn't excavate to that extent. Uh, if you noticed, uh, all the hull uh, was occupied uh, by shattered cargo. So we had to be very selective uh, where to open trenches. Mm -hmm. And the main scope was, you know, to understand uh, basic uh, uh, futures of the construction and to not go to detail. So I, 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 obviously I can't answer that. I think we have time for one more question.
Thank you. Uh, what did you do with the rect after the excavation process? Uh, did you cover it? Uh, did you? Oh. Yeah, it, it's covered with a specific textile that uh, prevents the deterioration of the wood. But uh, the thing is, it's still uh, positioned inside a living port in a very shallow water. So uh, uh, my impression is that uh, it will not live in the long terms. Uh, and it's, it's clearly one of the cases that, you know, the, the book of uh, UNESCO, how she, you should deal with antiquities and how should make a research doesn't give you any, any ready solution. I mean, you can stop uh, in the situ, function of a port. In situ preservation is what UNESCO says, uh, if I may. The, the solution is in situ preservation. Yeah, uh, I repeat, uh, it's, a, it's a case, if you have uh, huge cruisers, 200 meter longs, going in and out on a daily basis, there is no in situ preservation. There is no such things. On the other hand, uh, by that time we excavated in 2013, we were not ready to accept such a large thing to conserve it. I mean, we didn't have clearly the facilities. So what was what done was, you know, the very best that could be done. Thank you very much. We have coffee break. Thank you. Fascinating. Now on to the final presentation of our session. The San Geronimo shipwreck of 1576. It's all dated for you. Preliminary report on the hull design of a 16th century Ragusan nave. Jose Casaban and Irene Radic Rossi. So I guess it's Irana. So thank you so much. Um, uh, I want to thank, uh, of course, the Honor Frost Foundation for this very interesting and pleasant conference and also to the organizers of the conference. And I also want to say that uh, as I'm presenting currently in the parallel session with Mirko Rudan, I am happy that somebody believes in my skill to be in two places in the same time. <laughs> and I'm hardly working on this, but in any case, uh, I, I'm here with you because unfortunately, Jose Casaban cannot be here. And uh, he just recently defended his PhD and he's doing the last uh, facelifting of his thesis to get the title. Uh, but he was very keen to present our work to you. Uh, so I accepted and we are here. We don't have much how to present at the moment, but you will see that in the future, if we will um, overcome all the problems and the lack of uh, funding, etc., etc it could become a really interesting uh, and fruitful project. So we are uh, at the very end of the Croatian coastline, so to the southeastern end, very close to Dubrovnik and um, close to the, the famous Boca Kotorska in Montenegro. And it is the, the um, archipelago of Elafiti, Elafiti Islands, uh, composed of Shipan, Loput, and Kolochev. And you see the area uh, the rectangle on the area of the Bay of Sujuraj that at the time of the shipwreck in the 16th century was the part of the Maritime Republic of Dubrovnik or Ragusa that was at the height of its power, so the great rival of Venice uh, always in, um, in the Adriatic and Mediterranean. Uh, the the area where we are actually looks like this. This is a nice aerial photo of the bay that is uh, full of remains of the 16th century because the nobles from Dubrovnik used to have the nice summer residences on these islands and there are also several churches and one uh, ship shed in quite a, a bad state. Everything dated to the 16th century. And the place where the site is located is this one. You see the research vessels exactly above the site. It is the, the, close to the uh, reef that is named Malishkol, or the small reef, at the depth of about 28 to 36, 38 meters. This was the first sketch that was produced of the site during the rescue operations that were undertaken by the Maritime Museum in Dubrovnik and Anitza Kisic, the director in cooperation with Zdenko Brusic, who was always helping her in that area. 
and they did this work in three short campaigns from 72 to 74. And thanks to them, we know about the importance of the shipwreck. And actually, as in the case of the famous Gnalic shipwreck, that we did nearly the same thing. So we restarted the, the, the project after those people saved the site for future in the best possible way that could have done it at the time. So it is a kind of um, respecting what they did and trying to continue their, their work with, pre with all the, the skills, technologies, and everything that we have on disposition today. Um, so after their work, uh, the, about 200 objects were recovered from the seabed, and they ended up all in the Maritime Museum of Dubrovnik. But unfortunately, the limited space um, brought this uh, to the result of one small display uh, case in the current uh, permanent display of the museum. Uh, but you can see the selection of finds, uh, obviously very interesting objects that I won't discuss here because we, we have very limited time on this position. Some of them uh, chronologically very sensitive, so if you have coins, uh, you can immediately think about the date of your shipwreck. You can see Ferdinand V and uh, many, many coins belonging to Philip II and also a civil gun with the uh, coat of arms of the famous uh, Ragusan family De Primi, or Primojevic in the Croatian uh, transcription. So Jerolim De Primi, Jerolim is the name uh, uh, Hieronymus, uh, Jeronimo, Jeronimo, or the, 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 it is G, the, um, Girolamo, uh, exactly would be exactly the name of the ship. Uh, so the, it was clear that the ship had to do something with the family uh, after the initial uh, excavation campaigns. But what happened next what that was that in the testament of Jere Primojevic, it was uh, read that he actually owned the ship named uh, Santo Hieronimo. And after that, in the early 80s, Stepan Vekaric, the famous historian from Dubrovnik, recovered from the Dubrovnik archive, the state archive of Dubrovnik, uh, a couple of documents talking about recovering the guns from the uh, shipwreck sites. Some of those documents dating back to the 14th century, but many of them dating at the beginning of the 17th century. In one of those documents, we can read that the ship Santo Jeronimo sank in 1576 in the Bay of Sujuraj. It was actually um, 12 years after um, Jerolim um, de Primi passed away. Uh, so we decided that it was a pity um, not to return to the site and not to give it more importance than that one poor display case in the Maritime Museum. And when we visited the site, um, we actually realized that what was on the sketch was still present on the seabed, so the big accumulation of um, this concreted material of various origin, and also this big mound of probably ballast stones. So first, some, some first surveys we did with uh, Carlo Beltrame uh, in one participation, UNESCO participation program. And then after several other surveys, we managed to return uh, on the site with Jose Casaban in 2014. And in one day, uh, photographic recording, um, he and I, we managed to produce this uh, ortho plan of the, the site just to have the idea of the actual uh, distances and the disposition of what was still present on the seabed. And you can also see the position of the 2015 trench when we got to the final, uh, finally initial support from the Ministry of Culture uh, of uh, Croatia and some, also some support from the uh, Association of Friends of Dubrovnik Antiquities. Uh, if you compare this to the sketch, actually everything is present in slightly different ways. So the, the ballast uh, stones, and here you can see this amount of concretions that we are still recording and identifying because everything is iron, so very heavily concreted and not easy to identify. And uh, then we started the, um, the excavation, and we started exactly in the area where we knew that uh, the, our predecessors actually did some trenching. 
it was also the, the same case in, as in the case of Gnalich because that's the best way to check uh, whether in those areas there is still wood and still small objects to recover because of course if you go into the untouched area you can, uh, you can always find something but this was what we wanted to check and actually the wood was still damaged but very nicely preserved and you will see some details that are extremely interesting. So uh, the mapping was done uh, by 3D photogrammetric recording and traditional way and we also recovered some timbers, some of them were just uh, recorded on the seabed. Uh, the trench is actually six by six meters as you could have seen and not everything is cleaned yet uh, in the, in the, on the whole surface. So uh, what we managed to identify is this uh, poorly preserved stem, but uh, actually there is... So it is the, what I'm saying here is just the preliminary consideration. So uh, everything can change in the future because, uh, as I said, the wood is heavily eroded and it is very difficult to give the final interpretation based on the poor finds that we have until now. But the site is very promising, so... Please forgive me if I'm saying something that is not perfectly in line with what we will uh, know in uh, a couple of years. So uh, there is a rabbit on this uh, timber, that uh, rabbits on both sides actually, that led us to the conclusion that it could be the stem and also the position of planks that are um, entering this uh, rabbit. Here on this uh, image you can see this uh, part that was interpreted as the stem with the rabbit and the part of the, the edge of the plank um, uh, that was meant to enter it. And also on the other uh, picture, you can clearly see the rabbit on the other side. Um, uh, we didn't identify the keel yet, uh, although it should be quite near because there is a lot of lead sheeting you will see um, afterwards. So then we have the frames, uh, and eight of them were identified as the cant frames, and then they proceed as the floors, uh, probable floors, and very heavily eroded, so it is very difficult to see um, the scarves on them. Uh, some uh, traces of iron nails were identified, but we hope that in the, the, uh, in the continuation of the trench we will encounter much nicely, nicely uh, much more much better preserved wood. The problem is, as I said, that in this area, the wood was exposed already in 72, 73, 74, and of course it was not protected at the time uh, in the sufficiently um, uh, efficient way. So uh, the action of ship swarm is obvious. And uh, then we have the planking, we have the 10 strikes. If we consider that we think that we are dealing with the stem, of course it is the port side uh, planking, so the 10 strikes on the port side. And we also have some planks on the starboard, but they are all displaced planks, not attached to any uh, other hull element, uh, what we can see, say at the moment. So the planks of the average thickness of 6.5 uh, millimeters and from 20 to uh, 31 centimeters uh, wide. And then we have this lead sheeting and that, that is what makes this shipwreck uh, in, uh, really interesting because um, we knew that it was a lead sheeted ship because it was known from the previous excavations and there is also one big um, piece of metal sheeting displayed in that case in the museum. But uh, we didn't know how impressive it, it, it is and um, Actually, when we started to uncover this, uh, this area, immediately this lead sheeting appeared. So here you can see these this, uh, this big, long pieces of metal, of lead. So this one is the biggest one that we uncovered until uh, now. It is 50 centimeters wide, and it is 229 centimeters long. And um, we also have some lead sheeting in between the longitudinal elements uh, of the hull. And we also have those folded um, sheets that is still not clear whether they are folded around the longitudinal el centra central longitudinal elements of the hull or it is just the result, result of the site formation process. Uh, and um, 
of course, the best comparison is the famous Lamelina, so Villefranche, and here you can see one, uh, one sheet uh, of lead uh, of Lamelina, but uh, Lamelina sheeting is uh, 40 centimeters wide, so this one is wider, and it is just half of the length of these sheets that we, uh, we found on the Sujuraj shipwreck. So it is, it, I, I must confess that it is really impressive. This, these are just the small pieces that we are uh, recovering during the excavations because um, uh, there is a lot of smashed wood and smashed pieces of lead sheeting above so you can study the nail holes, the, the, the pitch and the textile imprints, uh, etc., etc. Actually, one of my students just wrote the, the master thesis on the lead sheeting, Tena Festini. This is the map that she produced where you can see all the wrecks that she identifies. It's altogether 23 wrecks because some, some points are indicating two of them. And all those are ships that used either, um, that were, uh, have the presence of either metal sheeting, metal, coke, metal uh, lead sheeting, lead coking, or lead patching. And if we talk about the lead sheeting, then we have Villefranche, we have Sujuraj, that is about 60 years later, and then 25 years later in the Azores uh, Angra uh, D shipwreck. So not many finds of the kind, and then also produced this nice um, representation of the, um, the um, chronology and the intensity of use of the lead sheeting, according to the archaeological finds and written sources combined. And we don't have much about Dubrovnik because we just uh, have this shipwreck as the evidence and we will probably in the future uh, recover much more either from the archives or from the archaeological record. Uh, and what we can say is that it is probably the result of the very, very tight connection of Dubrovnik to Spain. You can see that Spain is a very... Uh, for a very long time and uh, quite, uh, quite intensely using this uh, lead sheeting. We also have the rigging elements, as you can see, some of them very nicely preserved, so sheaves as part of the, the blocks uh, with cokes uh, in place, or different sizes of cokes um, everywhere. And also the chain plates, pieces of chains, some of them in the private collections, or, uh, or this one is in a church, uh, deposited in a, a local church, or some of them lying around in the surface layer of the site. Probably many of them still in situ, and it will be interesting to, to map them and study them in the future. We also realized that if we carefully examine the surface layer of the site and we move just the tiny sediment from the surface layer, we can uncover very interesting finds, so still very interesting small objects, millstones and uh, 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 weights uh, and then coins, still Philip II, the cannonballs and we actually recovered uh, a week ago also a piece of a samovar. So obviously the site has still great potential, as I said, and what is also important for us is that it, it is the only evidence at the moment that we have, archaeological evidence of this famous shipping, seafaring of the Republic of Ragusa. We have plenty of documents on ships and uh, shipwrecks uh, from, uh, the, the, from Ragusa, but we have actually very little uh, explored. So that's why all this uh, is very promising. So uh, a couple of days ago, we produced this, um, this uh, site, photogrammetric site plan with uh, Kotaro Yamafune uh, very efficiently. And uh, this is, I just laid it down so it is not uphill, as you saw the other plans to be more uh, evident. Uh, to show you the position of the trench that I was talking about, to show you the position of the mound of ballast and that mound of concretions. Uh, and then we also noticed and uh, mapped all the concretions and fi interesting finds in the surface layer and in the areas that are marked here, there are plenty of them. And we also uh, mapped the position of the two anchors. 
So, uh, whether the, the interpretation of the how is, um, is valid or not, or maybe it will change in the future, from this image, um, it is clear that it is a very valuable site, and I would be really um, happy if we will manage with the support of the local institutions and associations and, um, of course, foreign collaborators in the Ministry of Culture to continue the, this work as a, a, quite a demanding project, as you could have seen. And, of course, nothing without the happy and enthusiastic team. And thank you and thank them all. Thank you very much, Irena. We're actually out of time, but uh, we can take one question. Does anyone have, anyone have a burning question to ask? Otherwise, you can catch her during the coffee break. Did you raise your hand? No. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, so uh, we're done for the. Thank you. We're done for the day, and the um, the meetings. <laughs> reconvene at uh, four twenty. But before then, we have one announcement. Stella. Um. It's about the trips. It's a practical announcement. I know I've been reminding you about paying things, but <laughs> that's my role. So, uh, as you know, we have organized three trips for Tuesday. But uh, the girls in the front told me that uh, half of the people that are registered for Amathus have not paid yet, have not appeared there yet, so they don't know if you're coming. And the same is true for people that have registered to go to the Thalassa Museum. So it's okay if you have changed, it's not okay, but it's fine, I mean, if you have changed your mind. But even if you have changed your mind, please go and tell them, because otherwise, if you don't, if you're not coming, we'll have to change the buses and make uh, uh, arrangements accordingly. Thank you. Okay, there are seven people for Kirinia also that have not appeared. Thanks. Thank you.